Hi students, today we dive into the ancient Near East. This is Professor Franklin and please have a notepad ready for a few questions throughout our lecture. So the Neolithic culture, as we mentioned in our prehistory lecture, sprang out of a need for stability during a period of very unstable weather. Remember that the glaciers are receding as a result, the forests are starting to expand, the great creatures that were such a part of the nomadic lifestyle of the Paleolithic and Mesolithic people are starting to die out. And as a result, they're having to change the way they live. They're starting to settle around bodies of water. They are starting to farm and to domesticate animals. And those are some of the big changes that we see in this world we are stepping into. The world of the ancient Near East and this Neolithic era is a changed world. This is a world that has not only more stability as far as weather is concerned, but also access to free time. And free time, as we know in culture and in civilization, creates surplus. And in this case, the surplus comes in the forms of the ability to create writing, and that type of writing in this early world was primarily record keeping initially, and then that transformed into literature and poetry, written history, religious texts, and economic records. And just to circle back to a definition we also talked about in our prehistory lecture, the idea of prehistory, so the word history, a reference to the idea of writing, record keeping. So prehistory means before written records and now we are into the historic period with the existence of writing. These plastered skulls from Jericho represent some of the very early established burial practices in the Near Eastern region. This city of Jericho, one of the oldest continuously inhabited and fortified cities that we are aware of, there's a reference to this, this city in the Bible. The houses and public buildings are made out of plastered mud brick, and we'll see some examples of what that might have looked like in the next few slides when we talk about Katahoyak. But these would have been very rudimentary building, hand-built structures with sun-dried bricks. These skulls that you see, an example here of on the left, these were very important early burial practices. So in modern world, in the world we live in, we have the, the ability to either paint a portrait of somebody or take a photograph of somebody to have an established lasting memory of them, a visual reference to them. That obviously was not the case in ancient Jericho. And what they would do is after the deceased was gone and presumably their body had decomposed, they would pack the skulls with plaster and reconstruct the face in order to have this image, this uh, testament to a lost loved one that would live on beyond them. And these skulls often were detached from the body and they were often placed in benches that were built into the structure of the home or under the floors of the home. In looking at a place like Katahuyak in modern day Turkey, we see that this region, these peoples from this city, had something to trade, in this case stoneware ceramics, and we see that they traded quite far and wide from their, um, their center of their community. That not only meant that they had something to offer, but also meant that they were receiving gifts or exchange and trade from other communities. When we look at this city, the city reconstruction we're looking at here of Katahoyak, you can see that there's no roads inside the town. And unlike Jericho we just looked at, which was a fortified city, a city that would have had a wall around it and was built in a place that was harder to access, Katahoyak relies on this these close-knit buildings that would be accessed from rooftop primarily. So to travel between these buildings, you wouldn't walk down a sidewalk or walk down the road like we would today you would access them from within each of their buildings themselves. And having these flat roofed buildings also meant that they could continue to be built on top of. You see on the right hand side here um, into the spaces and you can see these benches and beds and a little ladder there on the right hand side. 
and these benches and beds would have been built into the structure of the building and similar to Jericho burial practices continued here where the dead would be buried in the homes underneath the boards of the homes and underneath these benches in the home on your piece of paper that you have I would like you to take a minute and jot down a little bit about these two questions I have here what does the treatment of the dead tell us about a civilization? And why did people bury their dead with artifacts such as swords, jewelry, and food? And one of the things I want you to remember as you're writing about this is the labor intensive effort that would go into creating something such as a sword, especially during this period of time, as far as technology and manual labor involved. And think about the idea that that sword being buried with somebody would take it out of use. So this useful tool that would have taken a lot of labor to create is now going to be buried with somebody. Why would that person have needed that item? What, would the, what was the purpose? What's the um, advantageous perspective? Why would they have done this? Why would they bury their dead with these important, useful resources for their community? The people of Katahoyak created a great deal of art and this seated female figure is one of my favorite images. When we look at her next to the Venus of Willendorf, we can see that she hearkens to this older song of the fertile, voluptuous woman. In the figure on the left here, possibly she is quite literally in the action of giving birth. When we talked about our Venus statue in our last lecture, our prehistory lecture, we talked about the uh, curvaceousness of her and uh, as well as in the Venus of La Houssel. These, these fertility figures might have been token items, items to help a specific woman get pregnant, something that would have been a totem for an entire community. We're not entirely sure, but the evidence, the thread of them throughout this 20,000 year period of history as a focus on something to do with fertility, the cycles of female life and childbirth. The figure on the left, potentially even right in the moment, right in the process of giving birth. You see there's also significant differences between these two figures. So on your sheet of paper, if you could just take a few moments, pause the video and just jot a little bit about what you see, what likenesses you see, and what are some of the significant differences you see in these two images. And please pay also special attention to the throne she's sitting on. I wanna just mention these creatures to her left and to her right. These are some sort of leopard, we believe, uh, or cat. But either way, the feline, uh, the feline in um, in mythology, this lion-like figure, is a figure of protection, of watchfulness. In mythology, lions don't close their eyes when they sleep, so they are always able to be there as protectors for those calling upon them. Mesopotamia, the region we're stepping into here, is situated in modern day Iraq. Mesos and Potamos meaning middle of the river, so between two rivers. And we'll see that on our next slide. The Tigris and the Euphrates rivers sandwich this civilization. I wanna talk about these rivers for a moment, and especially in the context of our next lecture in ancient Egypt. So I'm going to skip to that for a moment, the Nile River. So when we think about the ancient Egyptians, we probably have a sense of strength and long-term stability. The Nile River, which flows from south to north, there's only seven rivers in the world that do that. We know that every year this river floods. It floods the plains, this Nile River. It's predictable. It brings this fertile soil from the mountains to, in the south into this desert delta plain. And as a result, the people there have an ability to farm in the, the land in the desert. The Tigris and the Euphrates River were fickle rivers. They would flood unpredictably, dry unpredictably, the people that lived there were not able to count on these rivers and their functions the same way the people that lived on the Nile River. And as a result, there was not long-term stability that we see in places like Egypt. There was a lot of little city-states that would, that would 
grow up, show great power and potential, leave a great deal of art. And we have quite a bit of information about the rulers because these are quite literally the civilizations that created the first written language, the language of cuneiform that was roughly contemporaneous with hieroglyphics. We generally talk about cuneiform as the earliest language, but hieroglyphics was also developing simultaneously. But these people, unfortunately, did not have the stability in the region. First off, because they weren't protected by any uh, geographical features that helped them, but also because of this unpredictability of the rivers that they lived on. A few terms here that we'll use in our next few slides that you'll need polytheistic, meaning many gods. So these are people that worshiped more than one god. The gods were anthropomorphic, so human in form and character, but immortal. They had follies. They exhibited behaviors like jealousy, envy, love, passion, all the, the emotions that humans possess, these gods exhibited, but they could not be killed registers so horizontal rows and a series of horizontal rows that'll make sense when we see that in a few slides but you can think of it almost as a comic book strip so several either related or unrelated stories displayed in horizontal registers stylized this is a concept that will carry us all the way through the modern era distortion of a representational image to conform to artistic conventions to emphasize a particular quality and cuneiform, this earliest writing system invented by the Sum Sumerian people. The evolution of writing was largely a natural one that came out of necessity. Initially, these early cylinder seals were our first evidence of an attempt to show possession through some sort of imprint. These stone seals carved in intaglio, which is an impression that reveals the reverse, they created a continuous band of in images. They were often used to designate ownership. So the person that would have their own cylinder seal, this was like a signature for somebody. They might wear it on a, you can see that has a hole in it. And there's, it's a little more obvious in the next slide I'll show you. Um, they would wear it like a bead on a, a string around their neck. And this was used for several thousand years. And it helps us follow the arc of the pictorial style of these early people in the Near East. In talking about cuneiform, we see an evolution of writing that actually comes from something so basic and so interesting to me. On the banks of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers were a certain type of reed, and that reed had a little wedge shape to it. And if we look on the right hand side, so if you go over to column eight and look straight down, you can see that each of these symbols, each of these uh, word representations has this wedge shape to it and that is a direct result of the writing utensil that was readily available to these people so when they impressed the end of that reed into clay and made this triangular wedge shape so much like you'd expect on the left hand side initially this was a glyphic language where one image represented one word so for example bowl an image of a bowl and you can see how eventually as time continues as time progresses that bowl gets changed into several different lines that represent like we can think of in our language an alphabetic representation a letter representation so what initially started as a sound and a word changes to a phonetic representation by 600. I mentioned that there were these different dynastic groups that would spring up and then uh, kind of fizzle back out and sometimes that was because of re resource exhaustion or sometimes it was because of invading invading forces but one of these early communities was the early dynastic period of the Sumer people from roughly 2800 to 2300 BC during this period of time during the early dynastic pe period in Sumer there was a transition to full literacy and the two main cities we'll talk about are Telesmar and the city of Ur 
Now, looking at these figures from Telesmar, some of these figures are as tiny as just a few inches tall, two, three inches tall, and some of the larger examples are as big as three feet tall. We see a difference in clothing between the male and female figures. Uh, the third tall figure from the right you can see is a woman. She has her breast covered, her right hand, uh, our, our right, her left hand breast is covered. And right in front of her, you see a man with just a waistcoat on. The men are wearing beards, the women are not. All of them though, have their hands clasped in front of them and their eyes are super wide open in some sort of awe. So when we see folded hands, this gesture is not dissimilar from what we think of today, the gesture of praying or the gesture of being pious in front of something. And also these bright, wide open eyes, the, that's, that's still a representation, representation today of awe, being in front of something that is inspiring awe. There's many different ideas for what these figures are used for or what they were used for. But I think the most compelling to me is that they would have been some sort of stand in for people at prayer. And that also helps with the understanding of the hierarchical scale, the bigger, more important figures, somebody that would have had more money to create a statue that large, might have put this in a temple before a statue of a deity. And it would be forever in prayer representing you praying to that deity. I want to talk a little bit about the Sumerian culture and religion. And they have one of the more beautiful creation stories. Um, this is, I'm going to tell it to you the way I was told it. I'm sure that there are um, a lot more details and a lot more information to it, but I want to tell it more from an allegorical story perspective than um, a factual perspective for you. At the beginning of time, there was this great flat plane of the earth, and all humans, all, all of us, were lumps of clay on this vast horizon. And the gods decided to, to morph us, to fold us into form, into humans. And these little lumps of clay we're touching other lumps of clay. And those are the people that have rubbed off on you in some way, your soulmates, your partners, your children, your parents, your lovers. That is who was touching you at the beginning of time, your lump of clay brushed up against theirs. So we are formed into these lumps of clay and we are on this great flat existence. And above us is the dome of heaven. That's where the magic exists and that's where the gods are up into the heavens. This is the standard of Ur, and this it existed in the ground in only fragmentary condition. Archaeologists had to do a great deal of work in order to reconstruct this. As you can see, there's little teeny pieces of mosaic, and these are over a wooden core. This object is not very large. It's about 18 inches by 14 inches. And when we look at this, first thing I want you to notice are registers. So we mentioned that a few slides ago, this idea of horizontal rows and a series of horizontal rows. Here we have three registers. And registers, just like in a comic book, can either be related stories, partially related stories, or totally unrelated stories. Now I'm going to skip to the next slide here to show you the back of the standard of Ur. Now I'm going to come to a slide that shows them both simultaneously. Okay, so here we can see the front and the back. I know the bottom slide is a bit cut off, but bear with me because this is the only way to squeeze these two into one frame. On the top, you can see that we are at war. If you look at the third register down, you see chariots riding over uh, victims from a battle. And on the top, you see who the person that is obviously the center figure, the king standing in the middle, larger, a full head larger than anyone else in this image. And that is again a reference to the idea of hierarchy or hierarchical scale. That's a term that you'll need to know. Hierarchical scale means what is bigger is more important in an image. And it's a very quick gift to us when we're looking at art to tell us very quickly who is most important who's next in line, and who is the least important 
figures. So now if we come to our bottom slide here, and again, I apologize, the king's head is cut off on the left-hand side, but you can see by, he's seated, he's seated there, and you can see by the fact that his head is totally gone, he is the largest figure by a full head length, even while he's seated. Below him, people are bringing alms or offerings to him, this king that has dominated his enemy. So if we look at the fifth register down, or if we're looking at just the bottom image, the second register down, you see people in procession bringing things to the king. So on one side of this, we have peace, and on the other side, we have war. And together, this is representing the concept of power for this king. In the ancient Near East, one of the most important things that people were showing in their art was this concept of power in in uh, in leadership and in through war and through a strong hand of guiding. Here we visit another group of city-states, Babylon, um, where we had a frequent rise and fall of different cultural groups. The most famous king was King Hammurabi, who was best known for his widely established law code. This is the upper part of a stella or a stel, which is a type of boundary marker that was commonly used in the ancient Near East. We see on the left hand side of this, the King Hammurabi receiving the law code, literally being gifted the law code by Shemesh, a, the sun god from the Sumerian religion. So he is being gifted this language of law. I want you to take a minute and do a little jot about what areas of life did the code cover? Choose one law and explain its importance and significance to today's society because many of these laws have carried forward. And then see if you can find three of Hammurabi's laws that are too extreme or too harsh for the world we live in today. And maybe just talk a little bit about why those laws aren't fitting for the world we live in today. We'll finish our lecture today talking about the Hittites from Anatolia. This is modern day Turkey. These people also used cuneiform, kept records on tablets that were stored on shelves and cataloged, and we can equate that to our concept of a modern day library. They cremated their dead and buried them in urns, so there's little large-scale tomb art, but there are monumental palaces, temples, and citadels, meaning an elevated, fortified city. This is the Lion Gate from the Hittite, and you can see in it two lions, and we've talked about lion, the concept of ever watchful, ever protective. There's a type of masonry displayed here called cyclopean masonry. If we had a figure in this for scale, they would come up about a third of the way to the shoulders of the lion. So you can see that these blocks are so over life sized. And the idea of cyclopean masonry is the idea that the cyclopses would have been the only people strong enough to build something this massive. I wanted to show this image just since we're about to launch into our Egyptian lecture afterwards so you could see the clear communication between these cultures. This is from the King's Gate uh, in, on, in the same palace structure here. And on the right hand side, you can see the posturing, this composite pose the Egyptians used very commonly. And I'll mention that again in, in our next lecture. But you can see the face is in profile, the shoulders are frontal to the viewer, the hips frontal, and the legs in profile. That concept of composite pose, of using all recognizable forms to present the most recognizable view is something that the Egyptians really had mastered and used effect effectively and efficiently in their 3,100 years of art. And here we can see that the Hittites were borrowing from that, which means that the cultures had access to each other and trade to each other.